The homicide of George Floyd at the hands of three police officers in Minneapolis, Minnesota has ignited a tsunami of global protests in major cities of the global north and in communities and countries all across the global south. Floyd's death not only reignited the acrimonious debate on policing and institutionalized racism in North America, Arrest the cops. Right. Charge the cops. Right. Charge all the cops. What are you signifying? That you can kneel on a man's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds and feel like you wouldn't get the wrath of God. But also cause the people to reflect on injustices happening in their own backyards. Susan Bogle needs justice. How is it that the police, the military, the JDF, there's no consequences being held? This is not a wagonist approach. This is about, let us start about what's happening here in our own country, Jamaica. To discuss these issues, I'm joined by a panel of people of African descent in the Black Diaspora. Dr. Angelica Bean, a sociologist and criminologist at Howard University. Grenadian-born former Liberal Canadian MP, Selena Caesar Chavans. Their dreads, their super curly Afro puffs, their weaves, their weaves, their hijabs and their headscarves, and all other variety of hairstyles belong in schools, in the workplace, in the boardroom, and yes, even here on Parliament Hill. Ali Gill, a Grenadian-based attorney and diplomat. Lee Jasper the former Deputy Mayor of London. If he's robbing the next man's nation over the road of his oil, right? this is what they do. And Anna Kim Robinson, a human rights activist based in Kingston, Jamaica. It is Sunday, June 14, 2020. Current US President Donald Trump and the late Argentine revolutionary Ernesto Che Guevara were born on this date. Thank you for joining us for yet another installment of The Bub Report, Sunday edition. And social justice, actually, let me start that over. Let me welcome everyone. Uh, this morning uh, to a, another installment of the Kellen Bub Report Sunday edition. Uh, this morning we will be discussing policing, uh, racial and social justice, and how it affects Caribbean people in the African diaspora and Caribbean people all over the world um, who are based in uh, different parts of, of, of our community. We have Mr. Ali Gill, uh, who will be joining us from Grenada, uh, uh, Lee Jasper, who is uh, the former Deputy Mayor of London, Anna Kim Robinson and Angelica Bean. Uh, but we will start with Dr. Bean uh, this morning. Uh, Angelica, Dr. Bean, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I keep calling you Angelica, <laughs> <laughs> which is also okay, I'm sure, with you. Uh, but um, Dr. Bean, you are a criminologist and sociologist. And one yeah. of the things that I wanted to uh, bring you on to discuss uh, was the issue of defunding the police, because that has been a buzzword. Um, that has emerged within the last two weeks. 
especially since uh, in, in the wake of, of George Floyd's uh, murder, that there is the argument that liberals and persons who are of the progressive uh, way can actually uh, you know, have difficulties with that particular slogan because the argument is that the other side can use that to suggest that uh, you know, liberals and progressives and, and, and people of color do not want to have law and order in their communities. How do you respond to that? Hmm. Well, uh, first of all, thank you again for inviting me on, onto your show. Um, secondly, I think that we need to have a conversation with, with what does it look like when we are talking about defunding the police? Are we talking about defunding the police? Are we talking about disbanding the police? Um, that's going to look different from uh, city to city and state to state. Um, because the funds that for the funds for policing come from that city, so these are the residents. Um, the residents is actually paying in order to have a police force that's in place for them. So, in the wake of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, Ahmad, um, and all of uh, Trayvon Martin, not Trayvon Martin because he wasn't killed by police, but in the wake of all of these people actually being killed um, by the police force, what we're saying is that we're not getting protection from from um, the very people that we're paying to protect us. So one of the conversations that I think that we need to have is what does defunding mean and what does um, disbanding mean? So the, the defunding the police can actually mean that they're just looking at reallocating resources. So for instance, Minneapolis have committed to um, defunding, uh, just really dismantling their whole police department. They have like a $1.3 billion um, budget in Minneapolis and they're looking at cutting 200 million. $189 million of that money goes to their police force. So what they're looking at is reallocating those resources and actually putting those resources into mental health hospitals, um, back into the black community, into the most impoverished communities. So what I, what my answer to you is that we need to have a conversation about what does it mean to dissolve the police department and what does it mean to defund the police department and what is that going to look like from city to city and state to state. We need to get to the root of that first. Angelica, uh, what does the data look like with respect to defunding the police? Do we have examples uh, in the United States, around the world, uh, right. that yeah. would have actually engaged in a process of quote unquote defunding? Right. So, um, I learned earlier <laughs> that Camden, um, New Jersey, have actually um, defunded their police department where they totally dissolved their police department and rebuilt it and they had positive results. There are some other places around the country internationally, like Iraq, have actually um, defunded their police before, uh, force before that they, they, were, they didn't have successful um, results. So that's another thing that we're going to have to do the research on to find out exactly what have worked and what haven't worked. Um, and why, why haven't those things actually worked in different communities? Um, and so we're not, I think one of the things that we need to talk about is that we're not looking for law and order. There is actually some research that, because some people are thinking um, that if we if we defund the police, then we're gonna have lawlessness. But research have actually proven that, because um, New York actually tried a pilot program where they um, pulled back their, uh, it, it was called proactive policing for I think three months. And it proved that when actually they pulled back their proactive policing in New York for three months, that the amount of crimes and incidents that was being reported actually went down instead of going up. So that was the only example that I was able to find that actually stated where if you remove and people that actually put something into place, you know, in the United States, if you remove it, that the crimes actually go down instead of increases, increasing, but we don't necessarily have all of those answers yet. That's something that we're we're, you know, it's new uncharted territory. You know? Now, the, the other talking point uh, suggests that, well, there is black on black crime, uh, right. that black people need to uh, engage in policing their, their, their own selves. Right. How do you respond to that claim? I believe uh -huh. Candace Owens and others have actually made that claim last week. Well, first of all, I think when people bring up black on black crime in the midst of when we're talking about police brutality, or restructuring our police department is just a distraction. So I want to start with that uh, first, that we don't want to be distracted from police brutality and the killing of black bodies and people not being held accountable. So that would be the first thing that I would say. Secondly, what I would say in terms of black on black crime, they bring up black on black crime as if it's an issue that white people don't have and they don't talk about white on white crime. So um, when you talk about black on black crime, the statistics actually show that 90% um, of the people that actually, um, 90 yep. <laughs> so 90% um, of black people, black people are killing in terms of homicide, are killing other 
black people, but it shows that 83 percent of white people kill white people. And a reason that this is happening. So the numbers are not far fetched. They, why don't white people kill white people? Black people kill black people. And that's because of who we are actually are physically around. Majority of the people that actually kill people, they are killed. They know that people that get killed typically know they are selling. And that's because of where we are physically located and the type of things that we're actually engaged in. So white on white crime and black on black crime, they're almost running very similar. Blacks may be a little bit higher than whites, but the numbers are almost similar. And you see more poverty um, in a in a um, black community. But when you look at crime and homicide as a whole, as a whole, people that are typically committing, committing crimes, are impoverished. So I think that we just need to be able to, um, if we're going to have a conversation like this, number one of the things we need to do is not start black people and white people at the same end of the spectrum, because we don't start at the same end of the spectrum. We are arrest more, we're incarcerated more, and our sentences are longer. When we get out, we don't have the same opportunities, and um, and we're, we don't have the same opportunities as our white counterparts have. So these conversations need to be more nuanced, and we can't just throw... Um, throw black on black crime when we're talking about police brutality. So I would just go back to the same argument. It's a distraction. Black on black, you know, crime happens. White on white crime happens. Talk about white on white crime. Talk about black on black crime. But right now we're talking about police brutality and reforming or disbanding or disfunding the police. Now, you indicated that this moment uh, it sounds like it's right to enact a lot of the reforms uh, that you have actually conducted research on. Yeah, and what what makes you think that this moment is different from other moments in history, when in fact we had other in instances, other galvanizing moments? Uh, for example, when Eric Garner was killed, uh, there were mass protests across the country. What what makes you think that this moment is different? Um, I think we I think one of the things about social movements is that when major political players get involved, it can just become a movement by itself. It, it'll be labeled as a movement when major political figures actually get involved. And we've had people that have been historically silent that could have said something that are saying something now. Now, I say this um, carefully because I don't want to um, qualify my answer with a white response. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like we have to have, um, I don't need, to validate who I am as a black woman or what's going on in the black community by automatically saying if somebody white says something and it validates, you know, the fact that we've been dying, we've been dying. But what I do want to say is there is more outrage. There is more um, people speaking up that haven't had the opportunity to speak up. So police are able to speak up at this time. City officials are able to speak up. Well, Minneapolis voted, you know, to dismantle their police. Um, Presidents have always spoke up, but I believe we have more political figures that are actually talking about it. And we have major corporations, you know, that are backing. So if you look at people that are putting out major statements, now that don't necessarily translate into action. We're still looking for the policy, the change and for the killing of black lives to go down. So right now we just have symbolism. We have people that are vocally expressing that they want to have change, you know, that have historically haven't had but they had the opportunity to speak up and they didn't, but they're now they're doing it. And so I feel that we can feel it more on the ground because you have people that wasn't doing it before. Like I said, major corporations are political figures that are speaking up now and we can actually see the change in policy. It's changing, you know? So that, that would be my answer to your question. And finally, Angelica, a lot of these corporations have actually been critiqued for engaging in bandwagonism. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Sure, certainly uh, the community probably welcomes the support, uh, but don't you think that it's a bit uh, overkill? Somebody that's, you know, like, a, okay, so I, you know, I believe in protests and I'm most definitely, I'm out there on the streets, you know, beating the streets with all of our people and I've been doing it, you know, for a minute is, is when I found out that it should be done. Um, yeah, I do believe, I do feel like some people are bandwagon. I'm just hoping that, I'm hoping and praying that it actually raised more awareness and that people actually want to learn because of the bandwagon um, of it. I'm just hoping that it translates into policy. I don't need you to post, I'm with Black Lives Matter, when your CEO is the racist. He ain't hiring us, he ain't putting us in into um, corporate positions. I'm still not the CEO. I'm still getting hired at less, less you know, it's still a wage gap. It's still racial, you know disparities but although those things are true i don't want to be cynical um and say that these people are not going to move into that direction what i'm going to say is i'm going to look 
I'm going to pray. I'm going to be watchful. I'm going to be on the ground. I'm going to be fighting. I'm going to do my research. I'm going to talk about what we need to talk about and we can move from there. But I want to see the results in our people stop dying. Quit killing us. Quit killing us. Give us more money. Change the policies. Put these things in the place. I don't need you to say that you with me. I need to see that in your actions. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with you that it's most definitely some bandwagon um, going on, but it's also giving that bandwagon is giving people the opportunity to talk about what they believe that, that they couldn't talk about before. And we just gonna have to deal with you saying it the wrong way, doing it the wrong way and get through that process. It's, it's going to be a process for all of us. So this moment is different. It, it feels different and we should embrace it. All right. Uh, Dr. Bean, thank you so very much. Thank you. And uh, you enjoy your Sunday. Stay safe. We are still in Covidious times. All righty. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so uh, we will now be taking a break. Uh, I have uh, some, uh, and actually a, a monologue from two comedians uh, who have actually been reflecting on, on this moment in time. And when we come back, uh, we will welcome the rest of the panel and we will continue our discussion. Thank you for joining us today on The Bug Report, Sunday edition. How come it's not weeding out people who are inclined to enforce racial, uh, their racial biases on people? Why do we never do that? You know, when a police officer is trained and they're asked and they're screened, out of all the questions they ask about their gambling history, they ask about their drug history, they ask about their history of violence, they ask about their credit history. You know what they never very rarely ask? About their history of biases. They never ask about how they feel about these individual groups and what they would do. Isn't it funny how we can always have racial sensitivity training after you've proven that you were racially insensitive? We can always talk about we need to better our relationships. We need to be sensitive to other cultures after you killed an innocent black kid, an unarmed black kid. But never before. We don't ask those questions because we do not want to know. We don't care. It is not a disqualifier. If it's not on the menu, if it's not on the docket, it can't. When did punching someone in the head become a law enforcement technique? The cops need to make up their minds. They do a river dance on your skull, and then when they're putting you in the car, they say, watch your head. <laughs> we need to stop saying most cops are good like we know that to be true. I hope it's true, but I need some evidence, unlike cops. <laughs> The bad ones, not the good ones. Problem is, again, we don't really know what that percentage is. That's the question I'm asking tonight. If most cops are good, why are there so many videos of them being bad? <laughs> just in the last month, we've seen just a few bad ones beating the suntan lotion off a skinny girl in a bikini, completely atypical officers mercilessly wailing on a homeless guy in Oregon, and totally non-representative policemen beating a black man in Arizona. That's a lot of videos of guys who barely exist doing shit that hardly ever happens. Not to mention the Milwaukee Bucks Sterling Brown getting tased for a crime white people can't even imagine existing while black. This is why NFL players want to take a knee. Welcome back. Uh, I, am, I have the pleasure of being joined by Anna Kim Robinson, uh, who is based in uh, Colombia, but she's of Jamaican uh, citizenship. And we also have uh, the former deputy mayor of London, uh, the Honorable G Lee Jasper. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I have uh, the Honorable Selena Caesar Chavance, uh, who's actually from Pomerose in St. David's originally, but uh, she served as a member of parliament uh, in the Canadian House of Commons, and uh, she actually uh, was part of uh, Justin Trudeau's liberal uh, government. And so we would have, we'd, uh, probably have to explore why you left uh, the liberal party, um, the liberal government. And then we have from Grenada, uh, Ambassador Ali Gill, His Excellency Ali Gill, who is Grenada's ambassador to CARICOM, and uh, who has been writing on, on these issues of race, 
for a long time. On a personal note, I have to say that Ollie Gill was also my history teacher in high school at the Presentation College. So thank you, Mr. Gill, for joining us. Um, I would begin uh, with um, uh, 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 her ex, um, uh, MP Chavance. Madam Chavance, yeah. tell us, uh, what, 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 was, what motivated you? What was the reasoning behind your decision to uh, leave uh, Justin Trudeau's uh, government? Did, did race have anything to do with it? Well, I would say that there was a number of factors. Um, there was a lot of advocacy for a number of initiatives for the Black community. And although there were community for the first time in Canadian history in our 2018 budget, it was a minimal amount of money that was presented forward in the budget. I did not think it was enough. And I was a part of the discussions around how much money would be allocated to that community. So I thought that was it was really insightful to see that the only black female member of parliament out of 338 people, someone who had served as his parliamentary secretary was not involved in those discussions as well. Other issues like mandatory minimums, which we know disproportionately impact people of color and indigenous and black people to be specific were part of our campaign promise. It did not happen. It did not materialize because the liberal party thought it would be weak perceived as being weak on crime, um, you know, expungements for cannabis, which we legalized, we did not expunge the records of, again, Black people who disproportionately were imprisoned for small amounts of cannabis. There were a number of, of reasons why, personal reasons as well, why I left, but I thought that the open, transparent, bold, transformative government that Trudeau had promised did not materialize in those four years with the majority government. And uh, Mr. Jasper, I, I would turn to you. Uh, you served as deputy mayor. Now, during that time, are, are you really satisfied with the work that Ken Livingstone was able to do on issues of police reform? Because since Ken Livingstone departed office, I mean, you know, these issues of, of race and policing uh, are still persistent in, in, in the black community in England. No, I think that even, even with eight years trying to turn around a, a empire, which is the Metropolitan Police Service, with a £3.2 billion budget uh, for a mayor that only has tangential responsibilities for policing, is always going to be an exercise in soft diplomacy. So we were able to do some stuff, but what it taught me uh, is the fundamental requirement for structural reform in terms of police accountability and governance, discipline, and training that would really be required to make the fundamental paradigm shift uh, that we were talking about. So we made marginal difference in the eight years he was mayor, and we've seen that uh, eviscerate uh, after the uh, loss of that mayorality, and things have become incredibly much worse as a result. Now, we have seen that the George Floyd murder in the United States actually resonated in England. What do you think accounts for that kind of resonance? I think we have our own cases. Uh, 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 Sarah Reed, uh, Sean Rigg, uh, Mark Duggan, uh, Kingsley Burrell. Uh, there's a whole host of cases where we have disproportionate uh, black deaths in police custody, uh, in prisons and mental health institutions, immigration detention centers. So it resonates here as if it was one of our own. I also think that the virality of the modern age in which these videos can be seen instantly uh, had an effect. And thirdly, I think it was the trauma of watching those eight minutes, 46 seconds, which I could barely watch. Uh, and I know that the impact upon communities here was to trigger our own traumas in relation to what we've seen. And it's not just here in the United Kingdom. If you see the demonstrations in Paris, France this weekend, uh, where the French gendarme are tear gassing and baton rounding tens of thousands of people who came out for Adam Traore, who was suffocated by eight French police officers. Uh, and you look at the shooting in, even in Brazil, of a 14 year old boy who was shot in the back by Brazilian police less than three weeks ago. Or indeed, that the fact that in Australia, Aboriginal deaths in custody have doubled in the last 12 months with one particular nasty 
uh, uh, incident where uh, a man in prison, uh, uh, David Dunga, uh, is recorded of saying, I can't breathe for 12 times before he finally uh, leaves his mortal coil, means that this is not just an issue for America. It's an issue for the international African diaspora across the world. And I would bring in the rest of the panel. Uh, do we agree that this issue uh, is an issue that, that, that has universal connotations, as, as the Deputy Mayor said, for the African diaspora? If, uh, Mr. Gill, uh, you actually wrote on this uh, last week, right? Um, so, so do you agree that, 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 that there is some re uh, resonance for the entire uh, uh, African diaspora, that this affects us all? Mr. Gill, can you hear me? I don't think he can hear us. Yes, go on. No, I'm not at all. It's just, yes, yeah, we can have class. So, are you hearing me clearly? Yes, yes. I'm not hearing you clearly at all. Oh, you're not hearing me. All right, let, let's see yes. if we can resolve that. Uh, thank you very you... much for inviting me. Okay, yes, there's a bad, there's a bad, uh, bad connection. Um, I, I would get back to you. So log back on, log off, and log back in. Um, so again, my question uh, to, to the rest of you. Uh, and Anna Kim, I didn't get that question, uh, that first question to you. But what do you think? Do you think that has resonance for all of us in in the African diaspora? Yeah, I I believe that it 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 resonates across wherever you are as as um, Afro descendants of you know the. The racism, it manifests itself different, but it's the same in terms of the impact on the lives of black persons. So I can speak, for example, like from Jamaica and my work as a human rights activist, where you see extrajudicial killing, like we have among the highest in the world when it comes to um, corruption and, and, and just the like killing of police from of persons, black persons. I mean, majority of Jamaicans black, but the low social and economic background, um, where it's just the impact on the lives of black people. It's the same across the board. Just recently in Jamaica, we have the Susan Boyle, where um, members of the police for, force went in, and uh, somehow there was an altercation, and they ended up shooting. She's disabled three times, and we have scenarios like that um, throughout. Like almost every single day, and nothing comes of it. We have a man who just, his name is Noel, just died in prison after waiting 40 years without being trial, without being tried, like stuff like this. And here in Colombia, the work that we do here in Colombia is working with the Afro Colombians, and they've been displaced every single day. Like every day, there's assassination of Afro Colombian social leaders who are advocating for the rights of Afro Colombians. Just recently, again, we have our own in Colombia, like George Floyd, we have um, Anderson Arbadela was just one recent name that comes to mind. He was shot by the police for no apparent reason and nothing comes of the situation. And so what we, we are having to do here is to have that conversation about the systematic racism that is in Colombia that affects inappropriately the life of Black Colombians. So I, I, everything that is going on Everywhere that I've lived, and I've lived a lot of places in, 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 in Latin America, I've lived in the Dominican Republic, I've lived in Mexico. It's the same sort of uh, um, impact when it comes to, uh, you know, just black life not having any meaning um, and not, not really valuing, and, uh, not, not really having any value where they're killed indiscriminately and nothing comes of it, where they're among the poorest, where wherever they live, they, there are no infrastructure, there is nothing, it's like they're forgotten, they're always vulnerable. And so across the diaspora, this situation, this racism, and some countries, for example, in Jamaica, they will say it's not racism, it's colorism, but it's the same thing, it's on the same spectrum, it's the foundation of this is racism, where those who are of darker complexion, their life are less significant, you know? And these sort of injustices are brought against them with no recourse. Uh, Mr. Shabazz? I, I would have to agree 100%, and I'm, I'm glad that Anna Kim, Kim spoke about the tentacles of racism. This is not just about killing lives 
It is about uh, uh, systemic issues that penetrate our healthcare system, our education system. Um, when we show up for interviews, when we when we are disproportionately have negative impacts in our healthcare system, and the outcomes are the same, where we're either ill-treated or we die as a result of not getting those those treatments in our education system. When our our children children show up to school, but they are suspended at higher rates. We're talking about actually seeing somebody die on national TV, a, a, what we'd call a modern day lynching, but it happens every day, little by little with our children, with mm -hmm. our people, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world. And I'm glad the previous speaker brought, speaker brought up the indigenous community because in Canada, Black and Indigenous communities are overrepresented in our prison system. We have mm -hmm. lower health outcomes. Our education system continues to uh, disproportionately uh, do ill by our children. And that is something that I hope as we're creating this awareness around George Floyd's murder, we don't just look at policing. We look at every single system that has a racist, negative impact on our people, starting from our education system, going all the way up and mm -hmm. including policing as well. Now, Ms. Ravans, there, the, the, there is this idea that Canada is, is so much better than the United States that it is actually the true liberal North. Uh, Americans uh, tend to like to want to move, for example, to Canada, uh, especially after the election of Donald Trump. How do you respond to that? Well, I would want to move to Canada after the election of Donald Trump myself. Um, but <laughs> but to, to say that the grass is greener on the other side, I think it's a numbers game. The United States has, of course, a proportionately larger number of Amer Black Americans, uh, people of African descent. And when you think about the proportionality, we have the exact same issues where people here, I mean, just in Whitby, we had uh, DeFonte Miller, uh, beaten up by police. He lost his eye. We've had uh, Regis, um, Regis Korczynski Paquette just over the last couple of weeks uh, have a police interaction calling for help for a mental health issue and ends up dead. We have Indigenous, uh, indigenous women shot eight times. I mean, these are issues that are happening right across the world. I think that the Amer what is happening in America, because there's such a large population and they, they tend to use up a lot of oxygen, are creating that awareness that mm -hmm. countries around the world are, are leveraging and allowing these black voices and indigenous voices to come to the forefront because they're saying, hey, me too, it's happening here too. And don't think just by moving across the border, it's gonna be any easier. You're gonna have to fight the same battles with the same mm -hmm. intensity. And well, thing, yes, go, go on. Another another thing thing is that one of the positive I see coming out of this movement here is that, for example, here in Colombia, the, they've been voicing concern, they've been advocating, but it's just not loud enough. But with this movement and tagging on to this movement, it's amplifying their voice. And again, it's the same thing here in Colombia. The indigenous and black population, they're, they're at the bottom of the bottom. There is, it's almost impossible for next to impossible for an indigenous person or someone from the indigenous community or the black community to matriculate to beyond high school, you know? And so when you deny persons, so there's no sign that is saying, okay, oh, whites only, or in the case of Latin America, mestizos only. But when you make the system, so, so the subtle racism and you create the structures that prevent them, you know, you're pretty much saying, Mestizos only, and you're denying them that ability to get education, which is one of um, one of the probably the surest way to help them to improve their socioeconomic um, condition, so that they can occupy spaces within the society. And so, I am happy for this movement. So, just tomorrow, we're going to be having a protest that is going to speak about the issue of. Uh, racism in Colombia and the impact that it has been having on Black Colombians and indigenous population, um, which we've always been doing, but because of what is going on, because of the George Floyd, you know, protest and the, the, the awareness around it, that, that the voices of Colombians are amplified and they're able to tell their story, and that is what I look. I look forward to see what comes out of this. But um, yeah, in terms of 
one positive I see for now is giving other persons around the world to share their stories so that we can see that the issues are the same. The impact on black lives are the same across the board, manifesting in different ways, but it's the same. So it's not just America, like it's happening everywhere. Now, Mr. Gill, if I can get to you, uh, in, in your article in the Now Grenada uh, publication uh, last week, you said, let us be clear, the killing on, of unarmed black men in America is not some random act by deviant white police officers. These actions are symptomatic of the system that currently exists. Uh, these white police officers understand that they may not be charged for these offenses. If they are charged, they may not be convicted. And if convicted, they may be pardoned or at least get a light sentence. Mm -hmm. They know that. Uh, Mr. Gill, can you expand on that idea of, of sort of extrajudicial privilege that you think policing has uh, in the United States? Thank you very much, Kellen, and for inviting me on the program on such an esteemed panel. If we look at the, the history of that sort of violence in the United States, and we don't have to go far back, maybe within the last five to ten years, you would see that there are other incidences of, of police brutality, of unarmed black men dying in the hands of police, white police officers, who unless it is caught on, on video, as in this case with George Floyd, or we get to know about it somehow, those officers are never charged. When they are, if they are charged, even in this case uh, uh, of George Floyd, you would appreciate the length of time investigations continued before anyone was charged. If a black person, myself, yourself, would have committed an offense where the life of, of somebody uh, and was lost. One would have expected the police to take prompt action. That has not happened in the case of George Floyd. It is because of the protest and so on. Um, uh, the, he, he was, these officers were eventually charged. They charged one. The others looked on while he killed a man eight minutes, 46 seconds. His knees was on the, on, on the gentleman's throat. I can't breathe. The guy shouted out for help. The other officers looked around. And after Chauvin was charged, it took another week or so before the other guys were charged for eating and abetting. I'm a trained legal practitioner. I do a lot of criminal law in the Caribbean. I, I am not an expert in American criminal law. But at the same time, I understand the basic principles. Now, now these men are charged. You... Uh, take them to court and so on, and uh, they, you bring them before a, a white jury. It has happened in the past where even when they are charged, the jury comes back and say not guilty, and they walk the street the next day. So the practice is there. The practice is there repeatedly, time and time again, where these white police officers get away with murder, so to speak. But just to uh, pick up on what Anna was pointing out earlier on, and to the other panelists um, spoke about it's happening in London, it's happening in Colombia, it's happening in Canada. Now, you would observe in my article that I, I, I call for internationalization. One of the, our black countries must bring a resolution before the United Nations with regards to this issue. The United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, where systemic racism against colored people, not just black people, indigenous people, and, and so on. That must be brought to the fore before the United Nations. And a resolution must be brought. Because, you see, in other societies where these powerful countries, um, they, they, they look on other countries, they look at other territories and say, there are human rights abuses. The issue of George Floyd is a human rights abuse. And other countries must be, we, in the less developed world, the less powerful countries must table this issue strongly on the United Nations agenda. Let us use this ground swell that we are getting from this George Floyd issue across the world. Let us use this ground swell to get the United Nations to act. Now, the, 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 the United States is not a member of the ICC, the International Criminal Court. They are not a member. The United States, again, has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Accord. And they have moved away from all 
international checks and balances that we have in place to bring more multilateral approach to global issues. This particular issue of racism in America is not, it must not remain localized to the United States. It must be internationalized. And I believe that we must use that ground swell across the world to ensure that we, we table that issue at the United Nations once and for all, pass a resolution, and to hold the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and so on accountable for these abuses against colored peoples. Uh, th those are very interesting points, Mr. Gill. But on reflection, uh, do you think, because you know that there were Black Lives Matter protests happening uh, across the Caribbean, uh, this is the first time I think I've actually witnessed uh, th th that movement go global, right? Um, but th there were protests in Grenada. And, and, and one of the things that uh, Grenadians expressed on social media is that it, it causes us as Caribbean folk to reflect on our own issues of not necessarily systemic racism, but probably systemic classism. Do you think that systemic classism uh, is, is something that we have to address uh, as, as a Caribbean space? Of course. In fact, uh, my latest publication this weekend, I, I, I dealt with a, with a similar issue. Not so much classism, but consciousness as well. We, when, when Bob Marley many years ago spoke about uh, emancipate yourselves and so on, we as black people have to emancipate ourselves. In terms of, um, we can't be saying that black lives matter and then bleaching our skin. We have to bleach our skin to, to appear more white and so on. <laughs> our, the issue of our dress, our formal wear, if I have to go to the parliament, I have to go um, to any formal occasions, I have to wear jacket and tie. Right? So we still have these trappings of colonialism in our society that is affecting the consciousness of black people. So I believe that, that this George Floyd issue as well can inspire a, a, a consciousness among our people in terms of our dress, in terms of our speech, in terms of appreciating who we are as a people. That, that, needs to, that to my mind, is extremely important, that consciousness. And interestingly, you spoke about now you see all of the, 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 the protests throughout the Caribbean and so on. The Caribbean has been the, 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 the hot point for black consciousness from the days, and, and, and we have exported it to America. Marcus Mosiah Garvey from Jamaica was one of the first uh, advocates of black consciousness. And Stockley Carmichael, later known Kwame Tour from Trinidad and Tobago, Malcolm X, his, his, his mother, of course, is from Grenada. The Caribbean and the 1970s black conscious movement throughout the Caribbean and so on and so forth. We, in large measure, have really and truly exported black consciousness to the United States and so forth. You, you, you would know, Kelon, that in the U.S., slavery was abolished long after we did so here in the Caribbean, in 1865 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And 100 years later, in 1965, when, you, when the United States passed the, the, the civil laws in 1965 in, in under Johnson and so on, that's 100 years later. So even after slavery, you would have had laws in place still formalizing the segregation of black people in the United States. When we in the Caribbean, Jamaica, Trinidad, and so on, were getting independence. So in many respects, the Caribbean has led, and we are, we are, in some respects, we have been more fortunate than our black brothers and sisters in the United States in terms of the black consciousness, in terms of um, up, get, obtaining independence and different things like that. So in, in a real manner of speaking, the Caribbean has, has lent itself in a, in a very strong way to the conscious movement in the United States. It is just that in this case now, the United States is assisting the inspiration of, of, of a black conscious movement here in, in the Caribbean. All right, Mr. Gill, thank you so much. We're having a very interesting discussion. Uh, we will uh, take a quick break and uh, be right back. Uh, and as we go to break, uh, we'll be playing a clip from uh, the late, uh, great James Baldwin uh, uh, on, on issues of race. Actually, he was speaking out uh, on issues of race after the 1968 riots that occurred 
uh, following the assassination of, of, of Dr. Martin Luther King uh, back then. So we will play that clip and we will be right back. They know that, and they shut their minds against the rest of it, all the implications of being a black father, or a black woman, or a black son. And all of the implications involved in a human being's endeavor to take care of his wife, to take care of his children, to raise his children to be men and women, in the teeth of a structure which is built to deny that I can be a human being, or that my child can be. The great question in the country has been all the years that I've been living here and I was born here 43 years ago, is what does the Negro want? And this question masks a terrible knowledge. I want exactly what you want. And you know what you want. I want to be left alone. I don't want any of the things that people accuse Negroes of wanting. And I don't hate you. I simply want to be able to raise my children in peace and arrive at my own maturity in my own way, in peace. I don't want to be defined by you I think that you and I might learn a great deal from each other. If you can overcome the curtain of my color, the curtain of my color is what you use to avoid facing the facts of our common history, the facts of American life. It is easy to call me a Negro or a nigger or a promising black man, but in fact, I'm a man like you. So there we go. I need to, I, I keep not uh, unmuting my mic when I get back. Uh, but uh, as we wrap up, I'm, I want to get uh, the entire panel back. And I did pose that question to uh, Dr. Angelica Bean earlier. And the question is, where do we go from here? It does appear that, uh, you know, there, there is some momentum around how we begin to really discuss uh, in an honest and real way uh, issues of not, not only superficial racism, but issues of systemic racism. Uh, Anna Kim, I'm going to begin with you. Now, you are in Latin America. You work in the Latin American space. Where do you go from, from, from here in a region of the world that really views racism as, as a colorblind concept that doesn't appear to exist? Well, I would just think back on um, Mr. Gill, what he commented um, about um, being conscious. And I think that we, as a like, black we have to recognize that we also have work to do. We also have a lot of work to do. We also, it took like over 400 years to invalidate us, to make us feel that we were less to tell us everything about us is not good enough. So like comments that we make to our children in the school, for example, you look nice for a black girl, or the narrative that we keep on, that we've internalized, but we've internalized a lot about ourselves. And I think what, I think where we go from here in terms of this wave that is going on is also speak about us having work to do as well. That we have to be conscious and we have to start with our kids in the school to love everything about us and to, to focus on or to understand that the 400 years of us being, um, of us being told and not being told to love ourselves, that, that contributes to, to a lot among us as black people. And so we have to start the work on emancipating ourselves from 
very much mental shackles that are, that are happening. I'm seeing in Jamaica, there are schools where you can't raise your not after, like they're in a cough. They will tell you that your parents have to And you're like, how else am I supposed to get my hair or comb my hair? So like, it starts from us understanding that internally we have work to do. We've internalized a lot of the racism and we have to be conscious of that and to work on the narratives that we keep on telling ourselves and our children and passing it on from generation to generation. Psychological control is, is, is a lot to get over. <laughs> you, would, you would agree with that. Yes. Uh, uh, Mayor Jasper, I would get to you. Yeah, well, I think I agree uh, uh, with that entirely. I think the extent to which we are aware of our culture gives us a very much more stronger, resilient position informed of the sustained, systematic, global white supremacy in the form of individual institu uh, institutional systems of racism in our respective countries. Uh, having a cultural awareness of our history uh, and standing on that gives us that resilience, gives that ability to be able to make informed decisions about how we respond to that. I think Mr Gill's uh, proposals are very sound, uh, that a global push to bring this to the table of the United Nations, regardless of the orientation of the USA, is exactly where we need to be. And quite recently, we had a, a global Zoom discussion with the social movement in the UK, Black Sox, with uh, Dr. Clelia Pretes from Brazil, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton from New York, and people from France and the United Kingdom on this very theme, on this very discussion. And there's a great appetite around the world for a coming together of an international uh, dias African uh, diaspora to bring these issues to the fore in a way that uh, is a significant difference from the individual struggle we've faced in our uh, respective countries trying to tackle it. It is when we come together, as Malcolm, as Malcolm X always has told us, it is when we bring these issues of racism onto the United Nations human rights agenda uh, that we begin to make a real difference. Uh, but Mr. Jasper, I, I don't mean to cut you. I mean, if, if you look at the, the power structure of the United Nations, we talk about the United Nations, but really and truly, uh, you bring these resolutions, a lot of these resolutions gets vetoed by the United Nations Security Council, of which the vast majority of countries do not have control. Well, we look at the experience of uh, the struggle against the apartheid uh, in South Africa. Uh, we faced very similar problems there, where uh, uh, motions were vetoed. But it wasn't the it wasn't the structural blockage of the United Nations that finally freed South Africa. It was the global movement of people against the anti-apartheid struggle that gave life to the international agenda that finally made them take the right decision. So I accept there could be structural and political blockages uh, by these people, but the extent to which we can all march simultaneously in our countries of origin, bringing that global presence and that pressure. And the Black Lives Matter movement has shown that. I've seen more white people taking a positive anti-racist stand, holding up signs saying white silence is, is complicity uh, than I've seen in my entire lifetime. So I think the atmosphere has changed. There is a paradigm shift and it's up to us in our respective countries to afford and give that international leadership on these very pertinent issues. Uh, Mr. Gill? Well, the mayor said it well. And um, I believe the next steps would be the internationalization and keeping the global pressure at all levels. I have noticed that the, the Barbadian government, the prime minister, stated that uh, in the next sitting of parliament, that the issue of Black Lives Matter would be discussed and debated in the parliament of Barbados. That is what I think other, or other countries should be doing. So our leaders, our leaders need to do more. Our black leaders need to do more. And so that if Barbados is taking the lead to discuss that issue in this parliament, other CARICOM countries should be doing it. Ghana has taken a very forceful position too with regards to this Black Lives Matter and the death of George Floyd. The president has issued one of the first leaders to issue a statement against it was the Ghanaian president. So that if we have other black leaders, prime ministers, presidents, from the Caribbean, from Africa, from anywhere else, tabling that issue in the parliament. And as the mayor pointed out, let us keep the global pressure. Yes, there will be struggle at the United Nations. But as he correctly said, 
we keep falling away at it. We keep falling away at it. Because to really get where we want to go in this struggle for racial equality, it cannot be localized in the U.S. or in the U.K. or in Canada. They cannot fight themselves alone. All black people, wherever they are, must stand up and be counted. But Mr. Gill, let me challenge you on that. And, you know, I, I, I keep saying this all the time. We have an issue with the history that we teach in schools, it, it, in the Caribbean specifically, right? And, and that course. also needs to change. Would we you agree? We need to change. I agree 100%. We need to change the syllabus. You see, at some levels in the Caribbean, the, the how history has been taught, and other subjects have been taught, is for us to pass the students to pass exams. But if we our teacher, our syllabus need to be structured in such a way and get towards the liberation, liberating the minds of our people. And that is the, the, the structural shift I believe must take place in the in, in the syllabus. In the, in the Caribbean, not just the past exams. History is not just about dates and events and so on. The issues, all these Black Lives issues must be discussed in our, in our primary and secondary schools. Okay. Uh, so uh, the syllabus uh, needs, to be, needs to be aligned to that struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Vance, final thoughts? Where do we go from here? So, uh, yeah, I will, I, will, I will go ahead and agree with some of the other, the previous speakers and especially Ambassador Gill around the resolution to the United Nations. I, I absolutely think that that's, that is a directive in which the gl globally we could stand behind. Um, but when it comes to our education system, I think that there needs to be a clear understanding of the pain points within our education system. My, my husband's actual, his doctorate is around the factors that influence school uh, choice to go to university for black students. And his results have shown that guidance counselors often are the ones that steer our students away from university, away from higher education. So we're talking about George Floyd and it's, it's a killing of, of a man publicly, a public lynching. But you also have, as I said earlier, a, a number of our young people that are being, their, their livelihoods are being disrupted, are being killed by institutions like our education system that don't properly allow them to have a livelihood that they need to be, um, to be sustained in this, in this global economy, in this tech economy. So when we think about racism, we cannot just think of it from a one perspective of what is happening in the United States, we need to look at all the tangential points in which black people and indigenous people are being killed, are being suffocated, are being marginalized further by inequalities within every single system on a municipal, on a provincial and a federal scale and also globally. And Dr. Bean, uh, you had the chance to uh, hear a lot of our discussion and you back full circle. As we wrap up, uh, where do we go from here? You, you mentioned earlier that there is a lot of momentum, a lot of discussion, uh, a lot of ideas came out of this discussion as well. Uh, so any final thoughts from you as we wrap up? I think my, my, uh, my strongest thought from this panel discussion is that there's a need, um, like all the other panelists said that I totally agree with, is there's a need for us to have to keep the international pressure and specifically for African-Americans and all of the other African people that are here in the United States, and we need a curriculum that has more of an international approach so we can know how we are powerful together and what does that look like in terms of our curriculum here in the United States so we don't feel like we're siloed, you know, um, because we're taught to be siloed from our education system and the way that they built our curriculum. And for, for me, for a person who didn't go to HBCU until I was in my mid-20s, I don't start learning my history until my 20s. So I think that that's, I think it's important mm -hmm. for us to, to stick together. And I think it's important for us to turn in terms of policy and an international approach of, of how to deal with um, systematic race, racism, structural racism, um, uh, racial disparities in all of our communities that is global. I think one of the things that we should do is to look at this thing from an international approach to get together at the table and say, how do we, how do we look at building a stronger community for the black diaspora 
internationally, globally. So I think that that's um, one of my major takeaways from this is that we need to reapproach and reapproach at the table with all of us at the table so that we can have a better um, outcome whenever we're looking at how to address systemic race, racism that impacts us globally. That was all, all right, uh, Dr. Bean, thank you so much. Let me thank uh, the panel. Uh, I know a lot of you are in different time zones. Um, and, you know, it, it took a lot of work to get everyone here together today. But certainly we had a very fruitful discussion. I will be relying on your expertise again because these conversations we need to keep having. Yes. Uh, and, you know, th those issues will not disappear overnight. Uh, you know, slavery and colonialism lasted for a very long time. Right. And so uh, I tell people in the grand scheme of things, uh, African-Americans in the United States have been free for less than 100 years. Yeah. If we really think about it. Right. Uh, the Civil Rights Act was only in the 60s. Before that, you had Jim Crow. OK. Right. So there is a lot. There is a lot. Uh, you know, I was also reading an article uh, in the now Grenada publication about the, the compensation that one slave master received for his, his 40 slaves, I think, uh, no, I, I stand corrected, it's probably 400 slaves that he had between Grenada and Jamaica. And he received 10,000 pounds, 10,000 sterling pounds for those slaves. Now, if adjusted for inflation, 10,000 pounds in today's dollars is almost a trillion pounds. That is a lot of money right, that they received. So there is a lot that we need to be dismantling and we need to continue to have those discussions intelligently and move away from the slogan airing to ensure that we can get to uh, some substantive solutions that would benefit our communities. And on that note, uh, let me thank you. As a reminder, uh, the West Indian community in Brooklyn, New York, they are staging a protest this afternoon. I believe uh, they will be starting at the Grand Army Plaza. Uh, so if you are in Brooklyn, New York, uh, and of Caribbean uh, descent, uh, this would be an event that uh, the organizers are encouraging you to attend. Of course, they're also encouraging you to wear your masks and uh, try and practice social distancing right. as, as best as possible because New York City was actually the epicenter for the, the COVID-19 crisis for, uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, so on that note, let me thank the panel and a happy Sunday to all of you. Thank you.